Um, tonight we have Connie LaPaolo. Um, she's a, a well-known uh, author of the Jamestown Sky series. And tonight uh, she's going to talk about the unsung heroines, um, the women and children of Jamestown. And she'll talk about the, um, how they came over uh, in, the, in the hurricane and then uh, arrived in Jamestown between 1609 and 1611. And uh, th they went through some starving times. And she'll just talk about uh, what happened uh, to the women and children of, of Jamestown, which hasn't been documented that much in our history. Um, Let's see, Connie um, has a degree in finance from Virginia Tech and an MBA from University of Georgia. But her first love has always been writing, teaching, and history, and that's what she's doing now. Uh, Connie and her husband, Chris, have been married for 26 years and live in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Uh, uh, Connie has homeschooled her children uh, since 97. And uh, during that time, um, she's also been writing, and she's been spending that time also researching uh, for her, her books. And um, it, she spent about eight years uh, researching for her first novel, Dark Enough to See the Stars in a Jamestown Sky. Um, and her second uh, book, which took her five more years, uh, When the Moon Has No More Silver, um, uh, has also been published. She's working on the third book in her series, um, which will be av available sometime in the future when she finishes. Um, anyway, her first two books are for sale uh, in the back, and if you you wish, uh, please uh, do um, um, take advantage of that. Thank you, Betty, and thank you all for having me tonight. As Betty said, my name is Connie Lapalo, and I am the author of two books. The first is called dark enough to see the stars in a Jamestown sky. And this book follows the true story of Jamestown's first women and children from 1592 until 1611. And the second book picks up there, When the Moon Has No More Silver. And this book continues that true story of these real women and children, picks up in 1610 and goes until 1620. And as Betty said, I am working on the third book in the series, and that book will pick up in 1620 and follow these women and children to 1650, give or take, because that is when some of these original Jamestown women and children, the last of them, finally passed on. And these books together have taken me 13 years to write, and I'm about two years into this third book, and it's because of the research involved. And they are appropriate for all ages. I wrote these books for adults, but to my surprise, School Library Journal gave me a recommendation for grades seven and up studying Jamestown for this first book. They are clean, they are historically accurate, there are notes in the back, what's fact, what's fiction. I, I wrote these novels so that my children could read them, and so consequently I've, I've had quite a few kids as young as third and fourth grade reading these books, which has been a real pleasure for me. Uh, the first question people usually ask me is, how I became interested in the women and children of Jamestown. And I grew up in Hanover County with four generations all living together under one roof. And my great grandmother and I were very close and she would be 123 if she were still alive. So she could remember the turn of the last century and buggies and she had stories from her mother who had been able to remember the Civil War. And so growing up in Hanover in Mechanicsville, we lived on Civil War battlefields. History was all around. And my great-grandmother and I were, were very close, partly because she was a shut-in and I couldn't drive, and so she and I had also figured out that those middle two generations had all the power. So, so we bonded over that. When I was 11 years old, I woke up one night with a voice urging me to write her stories down. And that's what I did, and I drew up my first family tree at that time. And I've been researching my family tree since then. And it was about 20 years after that that I was at the Library of Virginia, and I had a few small children, I couldn't stay too long. But I was drawn to one particular book, and I didn't know why. And when I pulled it off the shelf, I found to my surprise that it traced one of my obscure 1830s Mecklenburg, Virginia ancestors all the way back to Jamestown, to a little girl named Cicely, who had come to Jamestown in 1611 when she was 11 years old. And this was the first time that I ever knew that I had ancestors at Jamestown. 
I had been a tour guide at Berkeley Plantation before that, and I used to drive from my home in Hanover down Old Route 5 and was always drawn to Malvern Hill Plantation. And I didn't know why, because it's really nothing to see. The old house is now gone. But only when I found this little girl, Cicely, who would be my 12th grade grandmother, did I learn that her daughter, Temperance, who would be my 11th grade grandmother, was buried at Malvern Hill in the orchard. And so this has left me wondering about our families, about the pull that they may have on us, things they may want us to know. And so I spent about four years thinking about the fact that I had never heard that there were women and children at Jamestown. I had grown up with a little history book in fourth grade that said that the first women came in 1619. And I have come to learn that this is something we've been teaching since about the 1920s, that there were no women at Jamestown until 1619 or 1620. That was the year of a bride ship. We had 90 unmarried young women, but what I learned is that we had two women who came in 1608, and we had nearly 100 women and children who had come in 1609, and they'd come in 1610 and 11 and 12, and every year thereafter that the men were coming, the women and the children were coming as well. So this bride ship has cast some confusion on the idea of women at Jamestown. So thinking about these women, I could not get them off my mind. And one day I went to a dusty old bookstore in Colonial Williamsburg, and now four years has gone by. And I was down on my knees, and I was just running my hand across the shelf. And when I got to one skinny little book called Ancient Adventurers, I felt something like an electricity coming off of that book. And I knew that this little girl, Cicely, would be in that book, and she was. This historian had devoted an entire chapter in his little book to the women and children of Jamestown. And he said that these women and girls were the contemporaries of Pocahontas, but that unlike Pocahontas, their bodies were forever a part of Virginia's soil. And that's when I realized that this was really a tragedy, that we had forgotten these women and children, and they're buried in unmarked graves up and down the James River, unmourned, forgotten, and worse, we have even denied that they were here. We, even today, our Virginia standards of learning have only recently been amended to say that two women came in 1608 and more women came in 1620. So I've actually just recently had the opportunity to work with someone at, at the Virginia Department of Education. We might be able to get a change made to these standards of learning. If we do, it'll be the first time in almost 100 years that we have taught the kids, the children in Virginia, the correct information about these women and children. And it's a pretty widespread problem because we actually even have 17th century interpreters who will still tell you that there were no women at Jamestown. So this is really a very uh, far flung problem. It's one that does not go away easily. One of the times when I realized that there might be a need for a book about the women and children was we had a historian come to speak in Hanover and he had written a, a very famous book about Jamestown about Captain John Smith and I went to his signing and I came up to him after and I said I'm interested in writing a book about the women and children and he was signing my book and he said there were no women and children at Jamestown <laughs> and my husband and I must have reacted because he stopped and he looked up and he said well they came later and that's when I said to him when I just said to you no they were here so feeling called to do this being in that little bookstore, reading about these women and children who are no longer even remembered in Virginia is when I decided that I would try to write their story and I did not feel qualified. I had a huge learning curve. I really didn't know any more about Jamestown than anybody typically would know. But I did go to Jamestown Settlement and I asked one of the interpreters if it would be possible to write a book about these women and children and he said, no, it can't be done. He said. If it could have been done, someone would have already done it. <laughs> so one of the things I like to tell children when I speak to schools is just because someone who knows more about something than you do tells you something can't be done, it does not mean it can't be done. It just might mean you have to go about it a little different way. So I walked away feeling called to do this. I knew he knew more about it than I did. And I decided that what I would do is I would just start. I would begin gathering information and 
when I got to a wall that I could not go over or under or around, then I would stop. But until then, I would just keep going and see how much information there actually was. And the interpreter was correct that there is no one depository of information about these women and children, but they are mentioned in the records scattered throughout. And in some of the later records, they allude to the women and children and things that had happened to them in the earlier days. So that's why the first book took me eight years to write, because it, there was a lot of research for me to do. And the first question I had when starting this book is why this little girl, Sicily, had come to Jamestown seemingly alone in 1611 to a settlement filled with men. And I began to understand that there was a mother involved. And genealogists had been saying for maybe 100, 110 years that there must have been a terrible mother back in England who sent this little girl alone while this mother stayed behind in England. And only after a few years of research did I learn that the woman we believe to be little Cicely's mother is Joan Pierce. And Joan had not stayed behind in England. She had actually come two years ahead of little Cicely. She had come in 1609 on the expedition with the 100 women and children. But now I had another question because Joan had come, she had left her nine-year-old daughter behind in England, but she had brought her little four or five-year-old daughter, Jane, with her. And I, at the time, I had, a I had two daughters, ages four and nine, and I could not imagine separating them. I could not imagine leaving one behind across an ocean. And again, after a few more years of working on that particular problem, I understood that there is a clause in the charter that says that all settlers ages 10 and up will be considered a full shareholder and receive full rights in the corporation, the Virginia Company. And it is not about turning 10 while you're here, it's about making the decision to sail at the age of 10 or older. And so I believe, and my theory is that Joan Pierce and her husband, Will, William Pierce, left little Cicely behind because she was nine years old. They wanted her to turn 10. They would then send for her. Well, the little girl, Jane, Janie, she's too young to be very close to the cutoff. She's about four years old. So I believe that that's why they brought her with them. So, but what brings a woman, all these women, to Jamestown in 1609? Why are they coming? The first thing you have to understand is that back in England at that time, they had been fighting the Spanish, the Catholics for about 60 years, ever since the Reformation. So the English and Spanish, Protestants and Catholics, great, great enemies, very bloody wars. But now, in the spring of 1609, we have an uneasy truce. And the English mercenary soldiers come home to England, and the Virginia Company has an idea. They say, these soldiers are unemployed. What if we could get them to sign on to to a struggling little Jamestown, two years old, it's not doing very well. These men are great, trained military men. They fought the best Spanish fighters over in Europe. If we could get them to sign on, and if we get, could get them to bring their wives and their children along, then we've really got a settlement filling up. So that was the reason for the clause stating that all settlers, that includes women and little girls, little boys, all settlers ages 10 end up to be a full shareholder. So when a man would come over and bring his wife and two children, 10 or older, they're going to have now four shares as a family. It's very enticing. One of the, the places who really took notice that the women and children were starting to sign on to come to Virginia are the, the Spanish. The Spanish are taking note. They have spies in the chamber. And they take this idea that suddenly Jamestown is going to have families. They take the idea back to their king and urge him to wipe out Jamestown. They say they, they're planning to stay. They're not just going to fill their pockets with gold and go back home. So one of the places I get some of my information is from the Spanish and the records that they've taken because they took very careful note of the women and children going over. And as far as the Spanish were concerned, the English here in Virginia were squatters. Spain has claimed this land from the, down in the Caribbean all the way up to Canada, and they say that it is theirs. So they are watching Jamestown very carefully. They believe and they hope that it will fall to the ground on its own. 
They believe the English are very incompetent and that that will probably happen, but they are watching. So the Jamestown settlers have a very difficult thing in front of them, which is that if they stay too small, the Indians will knock them over, will wipe them out. But if they grow too large, they will become a threat to the Spanish. And the Spanish will come and destroy the colony, which they had done to a French colony down at the border of Florida about 60 years before. And when they do that, they kill the men and they take the women and children hostage. There is a time in the second book where they spot Spanish warships in the bay. And at that time, the women and children know that they may face being deported as widows back to La Havana, Cuba, or Madrid, Spain. So there's a lot of danger in coming to Virginia, but there's a lot of promise, too. They love the fact that we have forests that go on as far as the eye can see. We have minerals and ores. We have these great rivers. They say they snake like fingers through the land. We have the Chesapeake Bay, which is as fine as any bay in Europe. We have these massive fish called sturgeon in the James River at that time. They could be up to 15 feet long and 1,000 pounds, very good commodity. There's also a white clay, a healing clay, that the Indians put on their skin. It's an ingredient in today's kaopectate. They've never seen it before. We also have exotic little animals like skunks and raccoons and possums. So they give these the Indian names. And they also hear that there's a wild cattle just west of Jamestown. They will find that in 1612 near today's Front Royal. And we'll give that the Portuguese name Buffalo. So there are great commodities here in Virginia. And the reason that they were so interested in our, in our lumber in particular is that they had been pulling down entire forests to build their ships to fight the Spanish. You can't do that forever. They also love the fact that we have sassafras growing wild. It's a new world plant. It was the wonder drug of its day. It was supposed to be able to cure anything. So there's a lot of hope, of prosperity, commodities. Now, what's it like to get on a ship and come to Virginia in 1609? Well, that spring day, 1609, at Plymouth in England, you have nine ships lined up. In the front is the great flagship Sea Venture. It's three times larger than all the other ships. And on that great ship, they will put all of their leaders. They will put the soldiers, many of the husbands. Captain Pierce, Joan's husband, he'll be on the great flagship. They'll also put their new charter, which will tell Captain John Smith that he must give up his leadership to these men. And they will put all of the food that is to see these 500 settlers through the winter. Huge expedition. The largest expedition that England has ever sent before or will ever send again at one time. Joan is not with her husband. She is eight ships back on a little ship called the Blessing with her daughter, little Janie. Now, when you get on a ship in 1609, the first thing you have to understand is there is no such thing as a passenger ship. If you get on that ship and you are not part of the crew, they will call you living cargo. Like the eight horses that were in the hold beneath Joan's feet. So they're going to get on this ship. They're going to climb down the ladder, the rope ladder called the scuttle, and they're going to go to the, the tween deck, the deck between. And that is where they will stay. The crew doesn't want them up top. They'll get in the way. The sailors have a job to do. So all the settlers, men, women, and children, are crowded down in the tween deck. And if you go to Jamestown and you see the replica ships, one thing they don't show you is that these settlers, being cargo, have cargo also beneath their feet. So the limited headroom you see there is even less than what it actually was. Now it's dark. They get a little light and air from the bow and stern, but that's not there for anybody's comfort. It's to help steer the ship. And they do have a hatch. They'll drop that down in bad weather. And again, if you go to Jamestown, you'll see that the, the ships have gun ports. Now, I always thought these were little windows and they get some light from there. No. These are sealed shut, the cannon in front of them. They are only going to break them open if they are attacked by Spanish or pirates. Very real threats in 1609. Now, it's dark, it's smelly. 
They have linen mattresses. They sleep two to a mattress. They pass the time singing songs, playing games. They have checkers, which they call drafts. The men may play chess. The children have uh, straw dolls. They have marbles. They have a peg game called Nine Men's Morris. They're going to eat. The food's not very good. It's going to come down in a bucket. The sailors will drop it down. On a good day, they'll get dried fish, dried pork, maybe a little peas and oatmeal. But on a bad day, the only food they are absolutely guaranteed are sea biscuits, which start the journey hard and very quickly become green with mold, and they get worms on them. It's dark. If you see the worms, you knock them off, but otherwise you have to eat them. That's all you have on this long voyage. Everyone will drink small beer, even the children. It's brewed three times, not very alcoholic, because the water goes bad on ship. Tempers flare. Eight weeks, nine weeks, ten weeks. They're going to be on these ships sometimes up to 12 or 13 weeks to get to Virginia. Very, very dull. However, this particular expedition will learn that boring is good. And that's because when they are just outside of Bermuda, the unthinkable happens and a hurricane at sea strikes the fleet. Now, what's a hurricane? They're not sure. Columbus had been in one more than 100 years before, and he had come back to Europe and told the Europeans, you have never seen a storm like this. We don't have these massive storms in Europe. And guess what the Indians on the Caribbean islands told me about these great storms? They said their god of wind and rain and thunder caused them. His name was Hurricane. And if Hurricane strikes you, he doesn't want you there. He wants you out. Now remember, this is a time where they believe in black magic and sorcery and witchcraft. They say the Indians in Virginia are the best sorcerers they've ever met. So the idea of an Indian god is very terrifying to them. They're in something the size of a school bus, the windows blackened out, when they're lifted stories high in the air, dropped. I often tell kids it would be like being on a roller coaster and there is no track on the other side. But can we make this even scarier for them? We can. I said they were right outside of Bermuda. They called Bermuda the haunted Isle of Devils. Bermuda was filled, they said, with ghouls and demons and lost souls. And the reason they thought the Bermudas were haunted is that the sailors, English, Spanish, Portuguese, the sailors going by at night would hear this eerie howling in the air around the islands. Obviously, that would be the ghouls. And then they would hear snorting and stomping on the island, which would have to be demons. Now, only later will we learn that the howling are birds native to Bermuda. They do fly around late at night. The sound is very eerie. The snorting and stomping, just wild pigs. But they don't know that. And this is a new route for them. Typically, they would have come up through the Caribbean, stopped to water, and then gone on to Virginia. This route will be a little shorter. It'll be a very hot, difficult voyage straight across the ocean. And it will take them past those haunted islands. So they're right outside of Bermuda when this awful hurricane strikes. But it just so happens this storm strikes them on St. James Day, July 25th. Now, they are Christians. And St. James was an apostle before he died. But he had been buried in Spain. And he was now resting in Spain. And pilgrims would come to his tomb and touch it. And the Spanish have told the English that they know that St. James wants the entire New World to be Catholic because they have seen old St. James's ghost in the New World heading up entire armies and fighting for them against the Indians. So is it Hurricane, the old Caribbean god? Is it this haunted Isle of Devils? Or is it old St. James, the old Spanish saint? Who is after this fleet? They don't know. So what's it like to be in a hurricane with your little girl. Well, Joan Pierce tells her story here. And she says, sitting on a mattress, Maggie and I had settled ourselves in for a good game of drafts. King me, she cried merrily, as she slid her piece to the front of the board. 
I was about to lay a red one atop it when Maggie murmured, That's odd. What's Harrison doing down here? It's early for rations. Harrison is an old sailor, and they've tried to butter him up. Maggie has had the idea it would be nice to have a friend up top, but they don't know if they've succeeded or not. Peering over my shoulder, I saw Harrison at the base of the scuttle. He clenched his fist and scowled. His eyes adjusted to the low light, and he squinted as though searching for something. At last, his gaze settled on the two of us, and he bolted over, grabbing each of us roughly by an arm. Master Harrison, Maggie cried indignantly, pulling away. What do you think you're doing? Quiet, Harrison hissed, leaning his face close to ours. I jerked my arm away. Who did he think he was? Where is she? He snapped at me. The winds roared now, and it was suddenly hard to hear. Who? I yelled. Your girl. Where is she? Get her now. He ordered with a fierceness I had never seen in him. Maggie and I stared at each other in confusion. He yanked my arm again, pulling my shoulder closer to his face. His fingers clamped so tightly that my arm throbbed. Wild and unflinching, he forced me to meet his gaze. My heart pounded. It's blackened and fast. The captain thinks it's a hurricano. I ain't even supposed to be down here, but I come to warn you. Get your girl, get her now, and rig yourselves in tight against something, anything. Grab a mattress. Hatch is going down in a minute, and I got to get up there before I'm missed. But, hurricane -o. Listen, ain't nothing can save a ship from a hurricane if the hurricane wants her. But prayers might help, so say them. And if we don't get through, pray your drownings quick. Before we could respond, he had turned to grab hold of the ladder, his feet barely touching the ropes as he scaled it. My heart raced, and I trembled in every limb, ill with terror. Janie! Maggie had already started to the stern where we had last seen Janie playing marbles. The light from the sky was dropping. I searched for the safest spot, concluding there was none. We didn't want to be where anything heavy could hit us. Brace with mattresses, I cried to Maggie as she carried the squirming child. Put me down, Janie screamed, uncertain why we'd snatched her. Janie, danger, stay with me, I yelled. Others were murmuring of an oncoming storm, but only Maggie and I knew the truth. We heard the low, throaty rumble of thunder in the distance, coming closer, the tail of the dragon as it brushed in a path toward us. Elizabeth lay near the ribs of the ship, weaker than ever. She had been sleeping, but the violent rocking woke her and sent her into dry heaves. I put Janie beside her and upended a mattress against the two of them. The ship pitched furiously, and the hatch above us fell with a slam. One of the crew secured canvas atop it. Besides two widely swinging lanterns, casting ghoulish shapes, the only light now entered from the bow and stern, and that light dropped ominously. Through those openings, I could tell the skies must be growing black, as though night had been born of day. Already the winds whistled around the ship, shoving it. Get out of my way, they seemed to cry, and in response, the blessing creaked and groaned as water lashed through the openings. The other passengers were shrieking and disoriented now. They understood. No ordinary tempest pummeled a ship like this. The thunder banged in ever-deepening tones, and waves slammed us from all sides. Either St. James would slay this dragon, or St. James was the dragon. I knew not which. Recommend me to God, my friend. Recommend me to God, my friend, is what the pilgrims traveling to the tomb of St. James say when they touch it. There's never been a ship since Columbus's time, 100 years before, who has been in a hurricane and come back to tell about it. They're in this storm three, four, five days, five days. No one in the little blessing expects to survive. They're tossed and they're turned. They say they cannot see any stars. They can't, there's nothing but night. But when at last they do see the stars,
they say, we're actually going to make it. It had been traveling with the fleet. Now gradually, the other little ships, they're all alone on the ocean. They find one another, they begin to meet. And one question is on everyone's mind. Where's the great flagship sea venture? Where's the ship that had our husbands, the soldiers, the leaders, the charter, and the food? It had been out front when the massive storm struck and no one had seen it since. No one ever will see that ship again either. Now the other little ships, they make their way into the mouth of the James River. Their masts are snapped, their sails are torn. They look like they've been in battle because in fact they have. And how are they greeted? Captain Smith, he has all his soldiers in full armor, all the cannon trained on them, all the muskets trained on them because he thinks his enemies, the Spanish, have come for him at last. He did not know this fleet was coming. Now Captain Smith knows he has a problem. He has 350 new settlers, nearly 100 of them women and children, and they don't have their food. And he doesn't have enough housing, so he, he begins to put tents in the field at Jamestown. And he does some quick thinking and he says, if I give everyone the smallest possible portion of corn, it will still run out in January. But we do have hundreds of hogs across the river at Hog Island. If we give everyone sparingly the hog meat, maybe that will last. We have those great fish, the sturgeon. They'll be running again in the spring. We have a few chickens here in the fort. We have, of course, the deer on Jamestown Island. And Captain Smith had planted corn. Sometimes you hear that these settlers had not planned, they did not plant any food, but Captain Smith had planted 100 acres of corn at Jamestown Island, but the rats and the rot had destroyed it the previous spring. So it was already going to be a lean winter for Captain Smith and his 200 men, much less adding 350 new souls to the number. Captain Smith was right. It was going to be a lean winter. The Indians now see that there's turmoil at Jamestown Island, and so they hold the island under siege. They, the Indians then go over to Hog Island, they kill the hogs, they drag the meat away, they run the deer off Jamestown Island. As Smith predicted, all the corn ran out in January. Now they have those few chickens, they don't last long, nor do the horses the dogs, the cats, rats, skunks, poisonous snakes, whatever they can eat that awful winter, they will eat. They are starving. But what about the fish, the great sturgeon, massive fish that run so thickly most seasons that they would joke that they could cross the river on the backs of the fish. But that spring, they write in their journals, their letters, we have not seen a single of the great fish this spring. We don't know why. This was the winter of 1609 to 1610 that they called, and we still call, our starving time. When at last help arrives in the spring of 1610, late May, there are only 60 of the 550 settlers still alive, and them so emaciated that they called them anatomies, we would call them a walking skeleton. We don't know how many of the 60 survivors are made up of the 90 women and children. 10 of the women were on the flagship. So how many of the 60 are those 90 women? We don't know. We only know that 15 years later they take a head count, a muster. And there are 15 of these original settlers still alive. That's 550 down to 60. Now we only have 15 of them. There are nine men, four women, one child during the starving time, and one little baby who had been born the winter of 1609. The baby was little Virginia Layden, and Layden's daughter. And Virginia Layden and her three younger sisters do grow up. We don't know if they married, but we think they did. The little girl who, who survived this starving time was little Janie, just four years old, 
and she grew up to marry Captain John Rolfe after Pocahontas died. I have just in the past week received information that they've got some genetic testing that proves that little Janie and John Rolfe, we knew that she had a daughter, Elizabeth. We now know that Elizabeth's genes live on. So she did marry them into the Milner family, and she does have descendants today. That was just really great news. And amongst the four women, one of the women was Joan Pierce. And Joan will live to a ripe old age. She'll live until about 1650. And she will live through many, many more things. They will have ongoing Indian wars, malaria, which they call the seasoning. They will have various types of dysentery and contagion. Their worst year, really, after the starving time was in 1622 when they have the massacre. At that time, about one out of every three or four men, women, and children are killed. And just following that, we have a typhoid epidemic, which will actually kill more than the massacre. So it's a brutal, difficult time to live in Virginia. And one thing you don't always hear is that these settlers were not allowed to go home until 1617, 10 years after the first settlers arrive. When they are allowed home, most do not. They go to visit. They go to get supplies, to get maybe some servants, indentured servants. But most come back and settle this land because they love Virginia and they believe in Virginia and they do not wish to give it over to the, the Spanish. They've grown to love it against all odds. And to me, that's one of the most remarkable things. Their greatest accomplishment occurs in 1619 when they are given the ability to have a little general assembly. It's not a big deal, not to the Virginia Company. But it is a big deal here in Virginia. They're going to get two representatives from every settlement up and down the James River, and those two representatives are going to help enact laws in Virginia. Now, the Virginia Company will have to approve them, but it, it is a big deal here because it is a taste of freedom. It is a taste of being able to have your own say in how a government works. That little General Assembly is the ancestor of our Virginia General Assembly. It is the model for the U.S. Senate and the first such representative body in the New World. The settlers stay and they build Virginia to become a prosperous place, a place that they call home. Thank you very much. I've often wondered uh, during the starving time why they didn't eat oysters. There were a lot of geese and ducks in the area. Do you have any ideas on that? Down at Point Comfort, which is down, uh, down at, the, at the bay, the settlers down there, there were about 30 settlers, they did eat uh, oysters. In fact, they ate so many crabs that they had enough to feed their hogs, the, the excess. So there's a small group of settlers who are down there. Apparently, no one down there knew what was going on with the main settlement up at Jamestown. At Jamestown, they say that we are killed as fast within from hunger as we are without from the arrow. So seemingly, they couldn't do too much outside of the fort. I mean, they could, I guess, do the river, but there are, they were being watched and they were being attacked. They did a little fishing. That's one of the things that the survivors, according to Captain John Smith, the survivors, and I think this is important because I told you the awful things that a lot of the settlers ate. But Captain Smith comments, the survivors ate mainly roots, walnuts, acorns, herbs, now and again a little fish. So they got a little fish. They weren't very good fishermen. Uh, they also said that Captain Tucker built a boat during this time, so I guess they were, you know, getting to the river a little bit, and uh, they say Captain Tucker built a boat and kept us all from going crazy, and that, that is almost a quote, and that comes from the governor, Percy. So they, they couldn't get enough in that little area that they had, I guess, to feed that many settlers, because of course they've got 550 people in this little area. <clears throat> There's a few of us here tonight think we descend from John Dodd. And I know you mentioned in your book that uh, you have no record of John Dodd's wife coming over here, so he must have married an Indian. And that's a story that's been handed down to our family that he married an Indian girl that was four years his senior. <laughs> and he was only 18 years old when he came here. And we, 
I always felt like he probably went to live with the Indians because that's how he survived. I don't guess you've you've researched any of that. that how, how would you go with researching John Dodd in England? I, it's, I've always been curious of how he came to come, being so young, how he came to be on his ship as a soldier and a laborer. It, for the individual settlers, sometimes you can find parish records. For me personally, one of the things I do is I go a lot to the families, like I went to the Dodds, the family, the research that they had accumulated. But I also go to the records in England, I look at the parish records, and sometimes I'm successful in finding these settlers. Sometimes I'm not, because not all the parish records are online, and the problem is they don't search very well. They're in little pockets of that you can search or not, you know, but you have to search individually. It's like you have to know the neighborhood to go into to find the record. Uh, Dodds was, as I recall, and you can correct me, I believe he came in 1608, is that correct? I believe he came in 1608, and you, you can correct me, is that, is that correct? Yeah, he came on with John Smith. And, um, he, was, he was one of the original, the crew. Uh, he, he, they say he was a laborer. He, I've got copies of John, uh, John Smith's diaries, and he's mentioned in that as being uh, 18 and being a, a laborer or a soldier. What, what's interesting about Dodds is he was in one of the earlier groups. Most of the people were, who were in the starving time and who survived it came in 1609, but Dodds survived long term and he was in, in a slightly earlier group, and that does make him unique. I have heard from various Dodds family members from across the country. So it's, it's quite an accomplishment. Any of the settlers that survived the starving time, and many of them do have descendants today, it, it, is, it is remarkable. Uh, he, uh, they had a, a son, and they named him Jesse, Jesse Dodd's son. And they tell me that's where the name Dodson's, there are a lot of, many, many Dodson's in this area. And uh, uh, they settled up in Richmond County around Farm, which is up right behind me. So. It, it, it kind of lends itself to being a little true. I, I don't know. I it, like to think it is in a way. I, I have heard, definitely heard from Dodds and Dodds sons who believe they are all descended from John Dodds. So it, it's very, it's quite an honor. And I would like to thank Connie for coming out and spending time with us and uh, giving us more information about uh, what life was like in Jamestown for the women and children and, and other settlers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.